Hi, I'm George Barna. Thanks for joining me today as we consider how to grow true disciples of Jesus. You know, as we've been studying churches around the country, one of the things that we've learned is that the whole ministry of discipleship is one of the most daunting challenges facing churches today, and one of the most daunting challenges facing individual believers as well. In fact, as you observe the activity taking place in many churches, you would kind of be led to conclude that Jesus' admonition was, repeat after me. In fact, that's not what he said. He said, follow me. It's very different and certainly challenging. During our time together today, we're going to take a look at how can we go about developing more effective discipleship ministry in our churches? How can we help individual believers to become truly committed to Jesus Christ and to live out that commitment on a day-to-day -day basis? In order to do that, what I want to do is kind of get a running jump on the process. I want to show you a video, a, a case study of a church that we found in Texas that's doing some great work in the area of discipleship. They're experiencing tremendous transformation in people's lives as a result of what they've learned and what they've been able to apply in the area of discipleship. Watch this video, and when we come back, we'll take it apart. We'll start to consider how can you too be involved in a great discipleship ministry. perspective on discipleship. We don't see discipleship as, as a program, in other words, a one-on-one -on -one program. We don't see discipleship done in small groups. Rather, we look at the mission of the church as discipleship, and everything we do intentionally contributes to that. So philosophically, we have to define what every single thing that we do, how, how it contributes to the, to the concept of discipleship. And uh, so consequently, we have really developed a very simplistic structure because we found a lot of things we were doing weren't contributing to that. We were challenged by a gentleman by the name of Bob Buf, uh, who said uh, churches measure their success by the ABCs, uh, uh, attendance, buildings, and cash. And at first we responded very you know, violently to that, well not us, we don't, uh, we don't measure our success that way. And then we kind of went back and in the quietness uh, of our office and in our own hearts, we looked at the things that we were measuring. You know, what were the things that we were writing down and talking about were uh, principles of growth and success patterns for us, and we found that we too uh, were measuring and C's. One of the unique things about what we've done is we've looked at what is the desired output for a follower of Christ, and uh, working with a number of other people, some uh, people in the church and outside the church, we've come up with um, the 30 core competencies, which is a set of 10 core beliefs, 10 core practices, and 10 core virtues to take the beliefs and the practices and the virtues of Christ to identify them and then to uh, put them in a way that people can understand them and then to put together and that they can pursue them. And though that's not something that somebody accomplishes in the first year of their spiritual journey, it's really a lifelong pursuit. We have developed what we call a spiritual formation calendar. Uh, it's very similar to a church calendar uh, that you would get in a mainline denominational church, except ours is our 30 core competencies. So we begin in January with the first core belief, um, and that is the Trinity. We spend the first three weeks of every year dealing with the Trinity. Then we move to salvation by grace. Then we move to personal God. Then we move to authority of the body. We move to identity in Christ. Uh, and so on and so forth until we finish the entire year. Then when we finish the year, we go back and do it again. One of the ways that we get uh, discipleship working in our congregation is through uh, the four eyes at Pantigo. And these are four ways that people can interact with these things. Uh, inspiration through our worship services. And this is where somewhere between 500 and 2,000 people show up and they're taught the particular thing that we're talking about. And uh, other churches would know this as the celebration. Secondly, uh, we have instruction where 30 to 50 people gather when we call a community group. Other people might, might call a Sunday school class. Uh, then there is uh, involvement where, let's say, 10 people, a small group gathers together and that's where life on life is taking place. And then finally, it comes down to one, the individual, where they are self-evaluating where they are in relationship to our definition of a disciple and then putting together a plan of how they're going to pursue that. If you looked at our organization, you would see relationships. You would see pockets of congregations. You would not see men's ministry, women's ministry, discipleship ministry, evangelism ministry, missions ministry, etc. You would see 
um, you would see geographical uh, congregations. And then from that, they execute the functions of the church. What happens in that is it simplifies their life around a geographical structure. It enables them to deepen with a handful of people. And then they together purpose as a community uh, to fulfill what it, body of Christ. The organizing principle is geography so that this community group comes from a community in the greater community of the metroplex here. And uh, the, the largest division of that would be a high school zone and as we get more density in that zone, there would be more groups coming from that zone. Uh, the idea being that this will be a cross-section of a neighborhood, ultimately, that will have young people, old people, uh, varied age and marriage status range of people, all of whom are pursuing becoming fully developing followers of Christ together. The question is, how are we structured to pull that off? Uh, we have one full-time zone pastor Okay, this would be a person who oversees uh, one or a collection of high school zones, who oversees five to seven mid-sized groups or community groups. These are collections of uh, 50 people who live in a geographical area, either a high school area, an elementary school, in a neighborhood. And uh, they have five to seven of these, which means they have around um, 250 to 300 adults, but by the time you add the children to that, it's about a congregation of 500 people. So we have one full-time zone pastor who works in that area. Uh, this person is responsible for everything the church is supposed to be. So if there's any work with men's, uh, the men, if there's any uh, compassion that's done in the community, if there's caring for one another, if there's a baby dedication, if there's baptisms, if there's funerals, uh, it's all geographical zone. The last uh, five funerals that has been done at this church I have not done as a senior minister. The zone pastor has done as that local congregation's pastor. Um, that full-time zone pastor uh, then has uh, five to seven volunteer shepherds, usually a husband and a wife, um, could be a single person, that oversees that geographical community group of 50. Under each of the community groups, all of our home groups are formed. So if you go to a, a mid-sized gathering on Sunday, uh, your home group is not detached from that. We take a core group of people out of that uh, group of 50 and form your home group, usually based upon a greater geographical density. And the home group leader uh, is works under the authority of the community group shepherd. And they usually have between five to seven home groups in a, um, in a community group. So the structure is very simple. Uh, one full-time zone pastor for every five to seven mid-sized community groups that meet on Sunday morning that are geographical in nature and every community group who is a volunteer has five to seven home group leaders uh, that he's responsible for in his area. Because we have pastors assigned to different geographic areas of, of the Metroplex, a pastor knows when a person comes in and they begin to build a relationship with that person, guiding them from the worship center to a community group, into a home group, and then uh, the home group leaders take over from there to actually begin to disciple that person and to multiply disciple. Not only involvement in one another's lives, but involvement in uh, the acrostic seven biblical functions of community, which we call service. Spiritual formation, evangelism, reproducing, volunteerism, international missions, care, and extending compassion. We probably did very little to deposit the love of Christ in a compassionate way in our community. This year alone, uh, I can think of three or four awards that we have received as the Faith Community of the Year, Volunteers of the Year, uh, and I'm really a congregation. I think a big part of that is decentralizing, getting real community thinking hard about uh, the issue of compassion. Not only compassion, though, all of our care is done. Uh, in, these, in these groups. So we do not have a centralized benevolence program. Uh, if there is someone who's fallen down, the community that they're in comes alongside of them and picks them up. Uh, they uh, meet financial needs. They, they come alongside and hold each other's hand. Uh, if someone is dying, uh, they're little with them from morning till night. They're watching their children for them. They're doing whatever is necessary. We say to them, you have the Holy Spirit within you. You have the purpose of being the body of Christ. Do what is necessary to accomplish this, this uh, function. Each person in that leadership mix will select and develop an apprentice. And when that gets all the way in place, then we'll be in a position to double, in effect, every one to one and a half years. 
in terms of our lead availability. They're passionately inspired to go after uh, what it is that God wants to do in their life. They're instructed in it and they study the Word of God for themselves, come together with other people who are doing the same. They're involved in putting into practice what it means to be a follower of Christ with other people, life together, and then they look inside of themselves and say, where am I supposed to go this year? And then I put together a plan for that. And the way that they do that is through a tool that we call the Life Profile, uh, which has 120 questions that allow a person to really kind of self-assess themselves against these 30 categories. The whole church is about making disciples, not just one section of it. And until that's there, it doesn't happen. When you, you make the decision to define it and that you get your key leaders to own it and begin to uh, model that, the third thing you have to do is make a serious commitment to fund it. If funding isn't there, it's never really going to get off the ground. Define what a disciple is, determine what are the st st strategic, intentional things you're going to put into play, and then take all of the resources, human resources and financial resources, and do just that. Nothing more, nothing less. It's exciting to see a church that's that carefully and intentionally focused on discipleship, isn't it? And we'll come back to what that church is doing and some other models that we studied are doing in a little bit. We'll also talk even more broadly about the whole process of discipleship. One of the things that we probably need to do is to recognize that that very word itself, discipleship, I mean, it's a classic Christian term, but as we did our research nationwide, one of the things that we discovered is that relatively few believers have a clue what it means. I suggest to you that as we think about discipleship, maybe we need to start off with a definition. And the definition I would give to you is that discipleship is a process that facilitates being and reproducing spiritually mature zealots for Christ. Now there are some key words in there. We're talking about being a disciple for Christ. Not watching other people be it, but us personally being zealots, disciples of Christ. We're talking about reproducing that same behavior, that same character, that same being in others. And we're talking about the nature of being a disciple, being a having a tremendous intensity, the zealous character of a follower of Christ. I mean, imagine yourself being Russell's, being with Jesus, the excitement, the enthusiasm, I mean, what it must have been like to be there, to be under his tutelage. And yet that's exactly the same kind of intensity, the same kind of demeanor, the same kind of character that we're meant to have. That's what discipleship is about. What do Christian disciples do? Well, I think we can look at a number of things that Scripture very clearly delineates for us. We know, for instance, that disciples embrace salvation by grace afforded to them through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We learn and understand the principles of Christian living. And that's important because you have to possess it before you can give it away. We know that there are the type of people who obey God's laws and commands. And certainly obedience is the bedrock of Christian formation. We know that Christian disciples represent God in the world. We are to be the living representation of him, a living model that other people can mimic, can understand the faith through. We know that disciples serve other people in the name of Christ, and that that service helps to bring us to whole maturity in our relationship with Jesus. We know that disciples reproduce themselves in Christ through evangelism, through instruction, through support, and so forth. And we also know that true disciples worship God. We worship Him with intensity, with sincerity, and with consistency. Well, what does it look like when it's working? If that's what a disciple is, what does true discipleship look like when it's working? And once again, Scripture is our best source of understanding what that's all about. Frankly, all we have to go back to a passage in Acts 2 where we have a very clear description of what the early church looked like, what the people who are true disciples of Christ looked like when they were together. You read that passage and essentially what it tells us is that they were individuals who were passionately and joyfully engaged in pursuing what I would call the pillars of what the church is all about. Those pillars being very simply evangelism, worship, discipleship, stewardship, community service, and relationships among themselves as believers. See, I suggest that as you look at a passage like that, you've got to be asking yourself this question. If you gathered all the people in your community together and you read that passage to them out of Acts 2, 
would they jump up at the end and say, oh, oh, I know who you're talking about. You're talking about First Church. That's exactly what they're like. How many people in your community would do that? Or, or if we're talking about individual disciples, when you read that passage in Acts 2, how many of them would hear that and at the end say, oh, you're talking about, and they insert your name. See, if that doesn't happen, we're not there. We've got a ways to go. We have to work on it. And I would suggest to you that the church in America is not there. Most believers in America are not there. So then we've got to ask the question, well, is it working? I mean, individually, is it working? Not only how does it work, but how are we doing? Well, let me give you some clues related to that. We've been doing a lot of research over the last 18 months to try to answer that very question about what is the state of ship in America today? How is the church doing? One of the first things that concerned me was we did a large nationwide survey among a sample of born-again Christians. Now, when I talk about born-again Christians, I want you to understand that what I'm talking about are people who say they've made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that's still important in their life today and who believe that when they die, they are certain that they will go to heaven because they've confessed their sins and have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. When we did this survey, what we discovered was we asked them, well, what, what are the most important things that you want to accomplish in your life? If you could narrow it down to a single goal that is the top priority in your life, the most important thing, what would that be? Do you know that in our survey, not a single person, not a single believer that we interviewed said that their top goal, their top priority in life was to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ? Now, you might say to yourself, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, it was a survey, and there are a lot of other things that would come to mind. That's my point. You see, when it comes to our priorities in life, the things, the kinds of decisions that we make, we don't even have being a devoted, committed follower of Christ in mind. We may think of it afterwards if we put it into some kind of a religious framework or context, but that's not what's driving us. In our survey, we asked additional questions, and when we asked people about their specific goals for personal spiritual growth, what we discovered was that only one out of every five believers could identify even one goal that they had identified for themselves for the year that they wanted to achieve spiritually. And then when we talked to those people, we asked them about those goals, we found that uh, you know, very, very few individuals were really committed to that process. In fact, when we put it all together, what we found is that most Christians, if they're going to set goals for their life, most of the goals they set will not be spiritual goals. And the spiritual goals that they set will be so generic that they won't really have a sense of direction. They won't know how to move forward to become a more mature follower of Christ. We also asked people how they define spirit us. And again, we got very generic answers. And then we went on from there and we asked people how serious they are as believers in Christ about their personal spiritual development. What we found was pretty unfortunate, I would say. We discovered that fewer than one out of every five believers would say that they are very serious about their personal spiritual development. We found that about half of all believers in our country say, well, they, they try to grow as a Christian. They try to become more mature, but typically they seem frustrated by the effort. And then we have the other third of believers who really don't even give it lip service. They really don't even try to become a devoted follower of Christ. It's a very unfortunate situation when you look at those kinds of numbers. Then we asked people, well, how much is your church helping you to become a really zealous follower of Christ, a true committed disciple of Jesus Christ? What we found was that most people said, well, you know, my church verbally advocates to Cypoc the game, but they don't really give me any goals. They're not giving me standards. They're not helping me to identify specific expectations that would enable me to be a devoted follower. We know that another thing that we found from the survey is that only one out of five believers say that their church truly facilitates their discipleship process. We also discovered that fewer than 1% of all believers perceive the worship services that they attend, and they attend them on a regular basis. Fewer than 1% of those worship services had anything to do with their growth as a disciple. We also discovered that people had mixed feelings about mentoring being mentored spiritually. Now, the, the mixed feelings wasn't so much that they didn't believe in the process of mentoring. In fact, what we discovered was that most believers have been mentored at some time in their adult life. Generally, it has not been in the spiritual realm. It's dealt most, mostly with their career or their business applications. 
And they found that mentoring was a very helpful problem, was a very useful thing in their life. But they didn't necessarily want to have that same process used in their spiritual development because they said, you know, what I found when I was mentored is that it's very intense. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. You have to be very committed to that process. Essentially, what they were saying is they're not sure that they're committed enough to their faith to have somebody who would mentor them in that. We also know that our research showed that many people, when we ask them, well, what are some of the kinds of tools, what are some of the aids and, and uh, resources that the church could give to you that would be most helpful to you in growing, they tended to choose the least aggressive and the least intensive, the least intrusive of those tools. And so once again, another indication that we're probably not as serious about this process as we truly need to be. How well are believers living out their faith? That certainly is one of the key questions that we have to answer if we're going to address the question of how are we doing in terms of discipleship? What kind of disciples are we? Is a question that we've got to come to grips with. Well, the way that, that we at Barnard Research Group tend to evaluate that is by going to, back to those things that we pulled out of Acts 2, what we would call the six pillars of the church. Again, worship, evangelism, discipleship, stewardship, community service, and relationships among believers. Let's take a look at those particular elements and see just how is the church doing. Let's start out with the whole area of worship. And again, this will be just a very broad sweep of how are we doing. There are many, many, many statistics that we could give us the full picture. But let me give you just a, an overview of how we're doing in these areas. Now, we start with worship. What do we discover? We find out that, that first of all, yes, about three quarters of all believers attend worship services in a typical month. That's pretty good. I mean, you have to kind of wonder why more believers don't attend, but three quarters is a pretty strong number. We know that four out of 10 believers, however, cannot define, even in their own words, what worship means. We simply ask them, tell them words, what does worship mean? We found that uh, this huge proportion of them have no clue. Many of the others who gave us a definition gave us, frankly, a pretty wimpy definition of what worship is all about. We also know that three out of 10 believers say that within the past 12 months, at no time during that year have they experienced the presence of God. Now recognize that these people that we were talking to attended an average of 30 to 35 worship services in the past year. And in spending that many worship services and having many other spiritual experiences, having the Holy Spirit living within them, now all of these things that they have going for them, about a third of them said, you know what, I haven't experienced God's presence at all in the past year. In addition to that, we know that half of all believers told us that they have not experienced God's presence in worship services, typically, that's what happens. They'll go to the worship service, but about half of them say, I didn't feel God was present. I didn't have any kind of personal interaction with him. And we also know that among fewer than one out of every four make worship any part of their daily lifestyle. Once again, they tend to see it as an event that they might go to on Sunday morning or Saturday, whenever those events might happen. But they do not tend to think of worship as part of who they are, what they do, what they strive to become. And so we look at this, and we've got some challenges ahead. Let's look at the second area, which is evangelism. And as we look at evangelism, again, from our research, we learn many things, some positive, some disturbing. One thing that has been very positive is we've seen that in the past year, about half of all believers say that they have shared their faith in Jesus Christ with someone who was not a believer. Now, I don't know what your context for analysis might be. You might look at that number and say, wow, that's not very encouraging. Only half are sharing their faith. Let me give you the context. That's the highest that number has been in the past decade. And so we're seeing that more and more people are willing to share their faith in Christ with non-believers, and that's a positive. It's particularly astounding, actually, at one of the other numbers that we know, which is that, frankly, less than half of all believers claim that they have a personal responsibility to share their faith in Christ with others. It's amazing, then, that so many did so. And also, it's kind of disturbing to realize that fewer than one out of every 10 believers has ever intentionally built a friendship with a non-believer with the hope and the prayer of eventually being able to share their faith in Christ with that person. We tend, in other words, not to be very intentional about what we're doing in evangelism. Perhaps we're willing, but nevertheless, again, we have challenges. Let's look at a third dimension, and that would be the whole area of discipleship. Now, we've talked a little bit about discipleship. Let me now focus on the whole aspect of what we believe as an aspect of, of what discipleship means in reality 
among believers in our country. Let me share with you some of the things that, that we tend to believe in America today. And again, I'm just going to talk to you about the belief systems of born-again Christians, the people who believe that their salvation is solely based on dying on the cross for them and them accepting that free gift of salvation as a result of that. We know, for instance, that in America today, about three-quarters of all believers or more would say, you know, some pretty good things. Things like, yeah, Jesus was born to a virgin. Uh, they would have an appropriate description or definition of who God himself is. They believe the universe was created by God. All the miracles described in Scripture happened. All people will be judged by God. That sin is still a relevant concept. One of the things, though, that, that we've got to be concerned about is this notion that more than three out of four believers contend that the Bible literally teaches that God helps those who help themselves. Now, of course, that's not found in Scripture. But do you realize that more than three out of four believers would argue that it is? I think that's terribly important for us to understand because, frankly, I would suggest it's the cornerstone of American theology. You see, if you exegete that passage, so to speak, what you discover is that it tells you so much about where we're coming from. What it says is that essentially the world revolves around me. I will make good things happen. I determine my own destiny. If anything good is going to happen, it's because of what I bring to the table, because of what I'm committed to, because of what I can make happen. If God wants to join in and grab onto my coattails, more power to him. He's allowed to do that. But basically what this is saying is it's about us. It's no longer about God. That mentality, that theological perspective has crept into the church, even among the true disciples of Christ. We can look at what else our people believe. And we know, for instance, that between half and three quarters of all believers would say things such as, you know, the Bible is totally accurate in all that it teaches. They would say things such as, Jesus didn't commit sins on earth, but recognize that that means that about half of all Christians are saying that when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, he committed sins. That's incredible. We can look at the fact that almost half of all believers say Jesus died, but he never had a physical resurrection. We can look at half of all believers, half of all born-again Christians say there is no such thing as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just a symbol of God's presence or power, but that the Holy Spirit does not live within people. The Holy Spirit isn't a real entity. The Holy Spirit is basically a symbol maybe a literary device that was used by the writers of the Bible. In fact, they would say the same, things about, uh, the same thing about Satan. That Satan, in fact, is not a living entity, that there is no kind of evil force or power or being that can influence your life. We know that, that uh, a large proportion of believers say that, you know what, you do not need to accept Jesus Christ to go to heaven. Many of them believe that, well, it's a choice you can make. Yeah, you can either go the route that I've gone and accept Christ as Savior, or you know, you can earn your way in. Or some other believers would say, well, everybody's going to get in anyway, so it really doesn't matter what you believe. We can look at the fact that between one quarter and one half of all believers would say, you know, there are some sins not be forgiven by God. Think about the implications of the fact that about a third of all believers will say there are some sins that cannot be forgiven by God. What kind of a God is that? We can look at the fact that a large proportion of them say, you know what, it doesn't really matter what you believe because we all basically experience the same outcomes after we die anyway. Or the fact that such a small proportion of believers would contend that they have a responsibility to share their faith in Christ with others. Or we can look at the fact that close to half of all, you know what, all religious, teach, all religious faiths teach essentially the same lessons, so it really doesn't matter which one you associate yourself with. Again, remember, I'm not just talking about people who show up at church on Christmas and Easter. I'm talking about the people who are the foundation of the church, the ones who have committed their life to Christ in whatever terms that means to them. And so we have a long way to go. In fact, one of the things that we discovered as we did our research was we gave people 13 of these core theological statements and we, their beliefs related to each of those statements. What we found was that when we did that, only 1% of all of the born-again Christian adults in America today had a firm and biblical stand on all 13 of those elements. You see, we've got so much garbage that's been integrated into what we believe the Bible teaches and what the Christian faith is all about, what God would have us believe, what Jesus would have us believe, that we don't even know truth from fiction at this point. So we have major... 
let's move on and talk about another aspect. We can talk a little bit about stewardship. And as we do that, what we come to, to find out is that four out of every five believers would say that they give something financially to their church every year. What we also know is that the average giving among those people is only about $500 per year. When you put it in the total context of their earnings, that's a very small percentage, only about 2% of all that they earn. And in fact, if we were to look at the concept of tithe, what we would come to realize is that, frankly, very few believers tithe. In fact, I'll tell you this, we have twice as many people who give absolutely nothing to their church and yet call themselves committed followers of Christ as tithe their income to the church. 8% of born-again Christians are tithers. 16% of born-again believers give not a penny to their church. Most of those people are giving money elsewhere, but they've chosen not to give to their church. We can look at the whole aspect of service, community service. And what we discover here is that about half of all born-again Christians actually volunteer some of their time during the course of the year to their church. That's a great thing. I mean, you'd like it to be higher, but at least we're getting half to get involved in the work of the church. We can look at the fact that about two-thirds of all believers are giving some of their time to a variety of organizations, the church included, but other, others as well. And we also know that about half of all believers, this is very interesting, when it comes to their spiritual gifts, half don't have a clue what their spiritual gift is. Remember, again, we're talking about believers. Half do not know what their spiritual gift is. Among the other half who tried to identify for us what their gifts were, a quarter of the total number of believers gave us a gift that isn't anywhere to be found in the pages of Scripture. Gifts such as the gift of happiness, the gift of laughter. You know, that's nice, but it's not one of the spiritual gifts that God gives. We only had about a quarter of all believers who could identify a spiritual gift listed in Scripture. Whether or not we actually use that gift in question. And then we can also look at the fact that about two-thirds of all of the individuals that are born-again believers recognize that they have a responsibility to serve the poor, but unfortunately only about one-third of all believers actually gave some of their time and money to serve the poor in the past year. In other words, more than twice as many people said that they had such a responsibility, but they recognize that they aren't fulfilling it. It doesn't seem to bother them an awful lot. So we look at this, you know, maybe we can wrap it up with a couple of other statistics related to how we're doing. One of those relates to the lifestyle of believers. We have done a number of studies, and we put this together. We looked at 65 different non-religious behaviors, the core values and core lifestyle behaviors of Christians. We compared those to the same kind of uh, values and attitudes and behaviors of non-Christians. What we discovered is that when we compared the two groups, the differences were absolutely minimal. There were differences of a couple of percentage points here and there. But in terms of real, practical, tangible differences, really nothing to show. We know also from some of the research that we've done that when we look at things like absolute moral truth, most believers would say, you know what, there is no such thing as absolute moral truth. Um, most believers would say if there is any truth, it's relative to the individual and to his or her circumstances. Believers saying this want you to keep in mind that that, as much as anything, has probably undermined the Christian church in the last half century. So as we, we look at all this, I would suggest, you know what, in terms of discipleship, we've got a long way to go. People have a hard time recognizing the church as the church because we haven't truly integrated these things that are the hallmarks of true disciples into our lives. Well, what's keeping us from achieving greater success in discipleship? Let me suggest to you that from our research, I think there are nine significant obstacles that we can specifically identify. Let me identify for you what those are. And I want you to be thinking about your life as a disciple. Are these things to be found in your life today? And I want you to be thinking about your church. As you think about what's going on in your church in terms of discipleship, are these obstacles evident? And if so, I want you to start thinking about how can we get rid of these obstacles. Now, the first one that we found from our research is the fact that so many churches do not have a clear and measurable definition of success when it comes to discipleship. You see, the chances of you reach goal are nil if you can't even identify what the goal is. And yet that's the situation so many churches are in today. Secondly, an obstacle is that we focus so much on knowledge to the exclusion of character. See, what we've done is we've said, well, the key to life change is knowing all the information. 
It's not the case. Jesus didn't come here to get us to memorize the Old Testament. He came here because he wanted to see lives transformed. And the way that you look at that is through the character of the individual. But in our churches, what we tend to do is we say, well, if you have enough knowledge, that will make you a mature Christian. The fact of the matter is we know that enough knowledge simply doesn't do that. People have to be able to convert that into some kind of character trait, some kind of behavior that people can see is different from the norm, from our natural inclinations. And so we've got to have churches that say knowledge, scriptural knowledge is good. It's important. It's something that leads us to that character change, but it's not enough in and of itself. Thirdly, we know one of the difficulties that we have in our churches is that the teaching that we provide to people tends to be random rather than systematic. And this relates back to the whole notion of our ideas about absolute moral truth. Part of the reason that people have come to that conclusion and to many of the other conclusions that they've drawn that we now call their belief system is because, frankly, we teach people good things, but we don't connect the dots for them. We're not helping them to put it all together into some kind of a mental framework that makes sense. We're not teaching them thematic fashion that helps them to understand how all of this faith stuff, how all of this scripture stuff fits together. You see, when we just throw them three or four good principles at a time, that relate to each other. Three or four things on family, three or four things on finances, three or four things on relationships, that's good. But you see, they don't have the ability to keep all that in mind and figure out, but how do these things relate to each other? How does the whole uh, reality, the whole content of scripture fit together into a way that I should think about my life? Our teaching has not helped them to do that. We know also that another element that we found is that an obstacle is that we have such limited accountability for spiritual growth. What happens is that few people have personal goals for spiritual development. Few churches are helping them with that. And so consequently, what you have is a lot of spiritual activity with no particular endpoint or destination in mind, and particularly without any kind of an accountability system or process in place. We know that an obstacle that many churches and individuals struggle with is that our churches tend to emphasize programs and efficiency more than they emphasize people and life transformation. Here what we have is a, a process where yes we want to have programs, programs are not a bad thing, but what happens is we develop the programs because we want to become more efficient in ministry. And the problem is after a period of roughly six months or so, the typical church program takes on a life of its own. And we tend to forget that the reason why we wanted the program in the first place is because we want to see people changed into the likeness of Christ. And so instead what we do is we, we put all of our resources, all of our energy into making sure that the program is sustained, that we can maintain it, that it's a strong and capable program without ever having a sense of, yeah, but are people changing? That's the only reason that we had it in the first place. Another obstacle in this whole process is that often what we do is we put too much emphasis upon small groups in our churches. Now, hear me carefully on this. I don't want to be misquoted. I don't want you to miss what I'm saying here. I am not against small groups. In fact, in just a few minutes when we start to talk about effective discipleship models, what you're going to see is that small groups are a key element within that process. But what I do want you to understand is that in most churches, what happens is we expect small groups to do too much of the spiritual development process. Groups, by virtue of how we develop them and who's contained within them and the skills and the gifts they're bringing to the process, cannot do all the things that we expect those groups to do. And, and so tip what we have happening is that we, we count on small groups to do all kinds of things like teaching. And, and frankly, small groups don't have great teachers in most cases. They don't have people who are going to push you and instruct you and, and hold you accountable in that way for that teaching. What we know is that small groups can be very valuable in terms of fellowship and accountability if they are properly structured and, and developed. But we've got to be careful that we don't put too much of the burden of personal spiritual development on the small group. We also discovered a major obstacle is that too few church leaders are absolutely zealous about creating true disciples of Christ. What we have are individuals who are so involved in so many other aspects of ministry that sometimes they lose their focus. Our primary focus needs to be that we are, first and foremost, disciples of Christ. Whether you're a leader in the church responsible for the budget or the buildings or the programs or the people, doesn't make any difference. The key is how are you developing as a disciple and what are you doing to develop disciples along the way, regardless of what the program or the structure might be. 
we also know that one of the other difficulties that we have is too many churches ignore discipleship among children. This is one we could really spend all day upon, but let, let me just give you a very simple illustration of how this works. If we look at this particular graphic, what it's showing us is that even in terms of evangelism, we know that most people who accept Christ do so when they're young. The graphic is showing you is the probability of people accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior by different age points in their life. And what we see here is that 32% of the people between the ages of 5 and 13 will accept Christ as their Savior. Among the people who are 14 to 18, there's only a 4% probability of doing so. Among the people who are 19 through death, that probability is only 6%. What does that say to us? What should be the strategies that come out of that kind of information when it comes to ship? Seems to me very clearly what this is saying is, you know what, children are critical in this process. We know that their moral development happens before the age of nine, primarily. We know that who they are is formed at very young ages. And yet, we tend to think, you know what, discipleship is for adults. We'll wait until they're 18, or we'll wait until they're 21, and they can think, and they're serious, and they're going to make commitments. It's at that point, then, that we're going to start to engage them in a discipleship process. Here's a clue. It's too late at that point. Yeah, we can see this happen, but we're missing the great time of opportunity in a person's life. A final obstacle that we identified in our research is that many of the church's best leaders are diverted away from discipleship to other ministries. Why? Because we don't esteem, esteem discipleship enough. We're too busy doing other things to build the church. We tend to be entrepreneurial in many churches. All kinds of reasons why we have that issue. But nevertheless, we cannot afford to abandon the discipleship dimension of our ministries by our best leaders away from that. They, we need to have great leaders heading up what's happening in discipleship. Well, clearly a lot of those are obstacles that we can address as we become more intentional about what we do in discipleship. But then we've got to ask, well, what are some of the characteristics of the churches that are doing a great job in discipleship? We had the privilege over the last year and a half of studying many churches around the country that are seeing tremendous results in the area of discipleship. At the beginning of our conversation here, you saw the case study where we showed Pantego Bible Church and some of the great outcomes that they're achieving in their discipleship ministry. There are many other churches that are doing great stuff. And what I want to do is share with you now some of the common characteristics that we identified across those kinds of churches. Let me go through this. The first of those characteristics that we identified is that these are places that have a very clear definition of what discipleship is. There's no ambiguity about what they're trying to create in the lives of the people who are associated. Now, we did find, I have to admit, that at every one of these churches, they had a different way of defining discipleship. But we did see that in spite of the different words, the different language, and how they put the words together, there were a lot of common themes, a lot of common concepts that were embedded in those definitions. For instance, we found that typically passion is one of the elements that's in that definition that people have to become passionate about their relationship with Jesus Christ, totally committed to it, intense about it. We found that the whole notion of depth has to be involved in mission, that we're not just getting people to participate in activities. Really, what we want them to do is to become complete in Christ. We want them to become mature. We know also that another element of that is that it has to do with practice. It's not about listening. It's not about absorbing. It's about doing. Yeah, you need to understand your faith if you want to be involved in doing these kinds of things. Uh, you know, but practice, showing it in reality, is critical. We also saw that it's an interactive reality. For discipleship really to work, discipleship is not something that happens in It's not a solo activity. It happens in community. And that's one of the values that the church brings to this entire engagement. We also know that it's a lifelong process. And typically, that has to be embedded in, embedded in the definition as well. Let me suggest to you a second characteristic that we found about these churches is that they have identified specific and measurable outcomes that they hope to achieve. They know what discipleship looks like. They've been able to operationalize that. And they go about facilitating that in their ministry. But measurement is key in that process so they can figure out how they're doing along the way. There's a third thing that we discovered that was common to these churches. And that's that they engage in regular and honest self-assessment. Again, the evaluation aspect. These are churches that are not satisfied with mere anecdotes. Oh, this woman you know, did such and such. That guy now knows such and such. 
That's not enough. What they're looking for is some kind of larger measurement that will tell them how the church is doing overall. And having an anecdote about one particular dimension of a person's life isn't going to cut it. It's got to be much deeper, much, much broader. We know that these are churches that are looking at measures of their individuals as well as trying to assess the church overall. Another aspect that we found to be common among these churches is that there is widespread participation among congregants in the whole discipleship process. What we discovered is in the typical church that's doing a great job in discipleship, between half and two-thirds of their adult believers are consistently and intensely involved in discipleship. Now, maybe you're saying, well, gee, why isn't it more than that? I tell you what, when you get a church where a majority of your people are intensely engaged in discipleship, it is going to revolutionize your church, and that church, in turn, is going to revolutionize its community. That's a pretty strong percentage. Maybe one of the benefits of knowing that particular number is you won't beat yourself up over the fact that your church you know, doesn't have percent. Very few, if any, churches that we've studied do. I'd also suggest to you that one of the things we learned is that the senior pastor of the church has to be a driving force in the discipleship process. The senior pastor has to be an individual who personally is engaged in that process, but is also a catalyst to other people getting involved in discipleship. The senior pastor typically doesn't measure the day-to-day -day operations related to discipleship, but is one who is constantly reminding us that all of us need to be engaged in that, and it's one of the priorities of the church. That senior pastor provides the passion and the vision and the energy that comes behind making that a reality. We found another element to be common to these churches, and that's that small groups are a very important, a very central part of that entire discipleship process. It's a limited portion of the process, well-defined, but very important. It's one of the cornerstones in that while it may not provide for teaching, it certainly provides for relationships and accountability, which is very difficult for the church to achieve in any other setting within it, the framework of its ministry. We know also that one of the other common elements of these churches is that the people of the congregation are expected to develop personal spiritual goals and plans. It's not enough for them simply to have regular attendance at the church. It's not enough for them to have a lot of friendships within the congregation. They've got to be thinking very specifically about what does it mean to be a true zealot of Christ, somebody who is being and using those zealots in Christ. And so they have to come up with some very specific ideas of what it's going to look like for them during the coming time period, whether that's a six-month time period, 12-month, 18-month, it's irrelevant. The key is that the person has sat down and they've thought and they've prayed about that process. They've worked it through with their spiritual mentors and coaches and guides to figure out, how am I going to develop? What's it going to take? Where do I go from where I'm at now? Another characteristic that we found of these churches is that the church loves its own discipleship resources. There, of course, would be the tendency in many churches to simply take off-the-shelf kinds of resources, take things that you can buy at a Christian bookstore or out of a uh, denominational catalog. I'm not suggesting that those are bad things. In fact, these churches buy those things as well, and they use them. But more often than not, what they've realized is discipleship is not a mass activity. It's an individualized, customized activity. And so what they're doing is they're praising themselves of all of the different kinds of resources that are available out in the marketplace and then tailoring them to the needs of the individuals whom they're responsible for discipling. We also discovered that in these churches, they tend to have a growth-oriented culture. They don't focus so much on programs. They're more concerned about, are our people growing? They want to know the spiritual context within which they're working. And so the kind of culture that they've created is one that really raises up, elevates the absence of discipleship as a ministry, discipleship as a lifestyle. And so they've created a, a, a way of getting people to understand that. They've created a, a process within their ministry that facilitates ministry activity that leads to true disciples. We also know that in these churches, what they do is they establish very uh, high expectations and standards for their people. When we talk about these things, they, they want their people to be involved in ministry. They want them to be in personal spiritual development. Participation is critical. Personal change is the goal here. They allow them to grow at their own pace. They try to help them get over the hurdles and the setbacks that they experience. 
but they recognize, you know what, if the church doesn't set the standard high, the probability is that the individual will set the standards low. Somebody, again, has to raise that bar to a place that's truly going to build the church to be what it needs to be. And I'd suggest, finally, that we saw that in these churches they anticipate the need for change. And so what they try to do is offer many options and choices to people. They give them small groups and sermons and leadership training and mentoring and Sunday school classes, all kinds of places where they can grow, where they can learn more, where they can be tested, where they can be held accountable, where they can be reinforced, where they can be encouraged. They need all of these different things working together to help shape them into the kind of follower that truly honors God. So we look at all these things and, you know, they're great, but what does it look to actually find such a place? We were honored to be able to study many churches around the country that are doing great discipleship. And what I want to suggest to you is that we actually identified five different models of discipleship that I believe are transferable to virtually any church in this country. No matter what the size of your church is, no matter what the denominational affiliation may be, no matter what region of the country you're located in, I believe these are five models that once you understand them, once you truly get it and inhabit these things, you could adapt them to your own unique context and you would adapt them as you would with any model in any domain of ministry. But let me take a, a few minutes just to describe to you some of these models. Now, the first one that I want to talk about is what I'll call the competencies model. This is the model that you saw described and shown in the case study that we had at the beginning of this session. It's a model that really is based on 30 different core competencies, spiritual core competencies, that people should possess in their lives. A model that, by and large, uh, is based on the notion that we are called to love God, we're called to love our neighbor, and related to that, of course, there are different beliefs and practices and virtues that should be integrated into your life. And so as we looked at that model, what we found is the fascinating thing is that the church has been built around the notion that these are core competencies every believer should have. And so everything that takes place in that ministry relates back to these core competencies. What we find is that they have a worship service where people are taught about those core competencies, but in an inspirational mode. We found that they have akin to Sunday school classes. Uh, they call them community groups. Some of you might know them as adult Bible fellowships. But the idea is then we break that larger congregation into a smaller unit. Those people come together and they're taught in an even deeper manner about the, the content that they were exposed to in the worship service. They go from there and during the week they're involved in a small group. And the idea there isn't that they're going to get more teaching, but now they're going to start thinking about but what does this look like in my life. And so there's discussion around that same content. There are goals that people are setting based upon these different competencies. They're able to focus on how am I going to grow to become a more mature believer based on the results of their having taken that Christian life profile that was alluded to. That's the tool that helps people to understand where do they stand in relation to these 30 competencies. And then, of course, the individual is responsible for putting all of this into practice and for making something of it. Church offers topical classes during the year that relate to those areas of competence. We also know that uh, every year the church invites people and, and really encourages people to go back and take that Christian life profile again to find out how have they changed, how have they grown, what's, what's really working, what's not. It's a wonderful model because you've got a, a church that's integrated everything around those core competencies. Maybe you'd prefer a different model. And th there's a second one that we can talk about, and it's what I'll, the missional model. The missional model is, is coming probably in its best form out of Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. What we know about that particular model is that it's based upon the mission statement of the church. And they've worked hard to make that mission statement something that is tangible, where they've actually identified six behavioral outcomes that they want to happen in the lives of their people. And that's the mission of their church, is to see people living that kind of a lifestyle. What we know then is that they take those, and when a person comes to the church, they invite them to participate in a class, kind of an introductory class on the fundamentals of what that church is all about. And if the person likes what the church is about, their basic beliefs and structure and activities, then they're invited to participate in a small group. Now, at this particular church, in this particular model, you really cannot be part of the church unless you're part of a small group. The real life of the church happens in those small groups. 
And so then what is, yes, those groups are life staged so that you're with people who are in a, a similar life cycle, part of the life cycle or life stage. Those groups meet every couple of weeks so that people have the opportunity to discuss what's going on in their life. Within those groups, every year, everybody who's in a group completes what they call a personal development plan. And the idea there is that they have been trained, they've been coached, they've been taught how to put this together. But what they want is the people in their church to specifically identify in relation to those mission-based objectives what they are going to do to grow in the coming 12 months. Those plans then are accumulated. They're given to the leaders of the church. The leaders of the church look at that and they say, okay, if this is where our people want to go, then we know what we have to provide to them over the next 12 months so that they can get there. At the end of the 12-month period, then there's an evaluation of, well, how did we do? And that becomes a state of the church kind of uh, lesson that's given to the church at the end of the year, as well as an evaluation of, and here's where we're going this coming year, again, based on your personal life plans. It's a very interesting approach because it's simple. Everybody can understand what's going on. Nothing is imposed upon you, and so it becomes very palatable to most people. You can grow at your own pace. You're the one who's really evaluating who you are and how you've done and so forth. It, it's, it's a very viable plan for most churches. But of course, you've got to have a mission statement that facilitates that approach. We can look at a third model, which is in many ways, and that would be what I would call the neighborhood model. This, I think, is perhaps best exemplified by Perimeter Church back in Atlanta. And what you find here, when people come to the church, essentially they start out by going to an inquirer's class. If they like the church, again, they would join the church, essentially, by getting involved in what they would call a neighborhood congregation. Now, those neighborhood congregations are groups of anywhere from 15 to 20 people that meet on a regular basis, um, generally twice a month. And it's within those small gatherings, those small based gatherings, that people actually experience worship and teaching and fellowship. Those individuals are led by a highly trained lay pastor, an individual who is not a professional pastor, but a lay person who's gone through an extensive and intensive training process to prepare them to pastor his or her congregation. We know then that from those neighborhood congregations, the people are broken up into what the church will call discipling teams, smaller groups of people, anywhere from five to eight or maybe even nine people, gathered around a spiritual mentor somebody who, or a discipler, somebody who is going to help them to grow. And the basis of that growth is what this church puts together called a personal life plan, where again, the individual is thinking long term about what kind of Christian do I want to become? What's it going to take for me to get there? And that is all based on some of the teaching that these people have received from some of the classes that have become part of the whole neighborhood congregation process. Once again, it's an interesting approach. We know that uh, to pay in this, people are signing one-year covenants, which is their statement of commitment to this process, that they really want to be engaged in it. They're committed to growing. And again, it's something that most churches could integrate. You've got to have thought through all the different elements, but uh, you, you can put that into play. Let me give you a very different kind of model. It's a fourth one, one that I would call the, the worldview model. And essentially, the way that this works is that people come to the church, and when they say they want to be part of the church, they go through a two-year class, a foundation class, something that will help them figure out, well, what are the basic teachings of the Christian faith? The fundamentals that I need to know to become a true disciple, to really build upon that foundation so that I can become someone who truly honors God, someone who really becomes a great ambassador for Christ. And so then, you know, after they've gone through that particular process, that two-year process, and it's a very dialogical thing. It's not a stale, stiff kind of class. Very interactive, very practically oriented, uh, very Socratic in its approach. What we know is after that, then, people will have a combination of Bible skills and knowledge and life applications, and they're asked to put that into practice through their small group. And once again, the small group comes into play as one of the critical elements of how the church then enables people to start practicing what they've been taught. The small group is the place where they experience that kind of accountability so that other believers who have been taught similar things can hold them accountable to what they ought to know and how they ought to live. Let me give you yet a fifth one, which also is something that probably could be adapted to your own setting. And that's what I'll call the lecture lab model. I think one of the, uh, the best examples of that particular model comes out of North Coast Church in Oceanside, California. 
the way that this particular model works is that things are based on the servant. What you have are uh, small groups that form among all the people in the church. But when they get together in their small groups every week, what they're doing is gussing the content of the sermon that was preached the previous weekend. When people are in the worship service, they're given an extensive outline so they can take notes during the sermon. But in addition to that, they have study notes, essentially homework, that they're asked to complete before their small group gets together to go even deeper into the topic that was taught about in the sermon that week. What we know is that these sermons are expository in nature. They tend to be taught in four to 12 week blocks. We know that when people get involved in these small groups, the groups themselves uh, last for roughly a 10 week commitment and people sign covenants that say, I will be here every one of the 10 weeks to discuss this and to participate in the life of this group. Then there's a, a break for one or two weeks, then people can sign up for the same group, a different group, that whole process of, of recruitment and signing up, you know how that works. But the key here is that people have this content, which over the course of a three to five year cycle, individuals have been exposed to all of the key principles that will enable them to have a biblical worldview. That's ultimately this process is that we want them not only to understand that worldview, but then because of the relationships within the small group, to be held accountable to live it out. But a whole different approach of getting that information into people's lives. Now, I know that I've just given a very cursory introduction to all five of these models. I would encourage you to contact the churches if you want to have more information about how they do what they do. Uh, their websites will give you ample information about the kinds of things that they're doing. Some of these churches are in the process of developing tools entire packages that will help you to put these kinds of models into practice. Uh, if you need even more information, I recently finished a book about this whole process that, that will give you more detail, will give you their websites, all kind of information. Perhaps that'll be useful. But, but the key here is can you start thinking strategically about what you're doing in your church related to discipleship? Rather than simply having good Bible teaching or having classes for people of all ages or you know, both genders or different areas of, of, of the community, can we start to think about what does it mean to be a real disciple of Christ? What is it going to take for us to create those kinds of disciples? How can we facilitate that process? I would ask you then, in, in closing, to think about the fact that, you know what, you've got some choices to make. There are different types of churches that are described for us in Scripture. I think one of the most compelling sets of descriptions are found in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And when you look at, at chapter 3, find two particular churches there. The church of Laodicea, which is described as a church that is lukewarm. It's neither hot nor cold, and the Lord says, I will spit you out of my mouth. In addition, you've got the church of Sardis, which is described as a church that has a great reputation for being alive, but is actually a dead church. My concern is that we have too many churches like the churches of Laodicea and Sardis in our nation. What we really need to do is to rethink what are we doing within the church? The information that I described to you before cannot. We've got to do a better job. Ultimately, what we probably want to do is become much more like the Church of Philadelphia, also described in Revelation 3. And the Church of Philadelphia is described as one that has kept the Lord's word and has not denied his name. It's a church that really is an authentic example of true Christian discipleship. Would your church be confused with the Church of Philadelphia? Would your church be confused with the church described in Acts 2? That's your, that ought to be your goal. Now, we've talked a lot here about the different choices, the different opportunities that you have. I'm hoping that you're going to seriously and strategically engage with all of this and make some changes in your own life, maybe in the life of your church, hopefully in both. But in order for that to happen, I would ask that you would take this seriously enough to take out a piece of paper and write down some of the things that we've been talking about that have struck you as perhaps the Lord speaking to you and saying, you know what, here are a couple of things, two, three, four things that I need to do to become a more authentic, a more intense, a more zealous disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe you can identify two or three things that you could bring before the leaders of your church. Maybe you are the leader of your church and you can just bring it to your people as changes that could take place that would revolutionize how discipleship happens within your church. Again, one of my great fears is that you'll listen to this whole discussion that we've had here and you'll say, wow, this is interesting information. Kind of sad in places, kind of exhilarating in others. But my point is, it's not about, it's about transformation. 
You've got to take this and convert it into ministry strategies, into ministry action. Will you do that, please? You're not doing it for me. You're doing it for yourself in terms of your relationship with Christ. If you need additional information, I'd encourage you to take a look at the book that I wrote called Growing True Disciples of Jesus. I hope that'll be helpful. But ultimately, commit yourself to the